So let's then go to uh, pro-competitive motivations for these vertical agreements or for vertical mergers. In particular, let me look at, uh, yeah, at uh, the phenomenon which you already have seen, uh, I guess, in your in one of your I.O. classes before, which is double marginalization. So let's recall what that again is. So in order to start that, basically, let's first look at uh, well, the simplest possible vertical structure that we might be able to imagine, which just have one supplier firm and one retail, retailing firm. And this retailing firm is then, of course, selling to, to end user consumers. So this is a very simple uh, vertical supply chain. Uh, so let's uh, model this um, uh, in the following way. So we consider this uh, supplier, let's call it U for upstream. So that's an upstream monopolist. And suppose this monopolist has some cost of producing this input good. So marginal cost is going to be C. And it can write a contract with the downstream, with the retailer, uh, in which it prices its upstream good, its input good, at a wholesale price W. So W for wholesale price. And so that's just going to be the linear price in the sense that if you buy twice as a large a quantity of goods, you will buy just twice as large, uh, you'll pay twice as large an amount of money. So then this retailer, let's call them D, is also a monopolist. So for the retailers, this W, this, this, uh, this wholesale price is a cost, right? So they're buying the stuff that they need to sell onwards to consumers at a cost W, if you a W per unit. So that's a marginal cost again. And then, of course, the, the retailer is going to, de to decide upon its price that it's going to charge to, uh, to consumers, and that's called a P. Then, finally, there will be consumers, and they will observe this price P, and they will decide how much their demand is, and that's going to be some quantity as a function of this price that was set by the retailer. So, and then, well, what we're going to do is uh, look at this in terms of a game. So, this is going to be a two-period game. So, in the first period, so T equals 1, that's the first period, this firm, the upstream firm, the, the manufacturer, the supplier, U, is going to decide, well, what's this wholesale price, is W that I'm going to set to this retail firm going to be, so what's W? So in the second stage, uh, second period of this game, this downstream firm, D, the retailer, is going to observe what this wholesale price is, and based on the realization of the W from the first period, they will decide on how to set the downstream price P for consumer, consumer price P. Uh, and then, of course, uh, consumers will observe that P and they will make their, 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 their consumption decisions. So in order to solve that game, this two-stage two game, how do you do that? Well, you typically start at the end, right? You start at stage two. Uh, figure out what's the best action for uh, for the player who is acting in stage two, which is his downstream firm setting this pri the price in stage two, but taking as given what the upstream price, the, the, the input price, the wholesale price W is. So D is what's it going to do, the downstream firm is going to do, what's well, going to optimize its profits by D downstream fir firm's profits and you know, what are those profits well they are just the margin that they make which is the price minus the uh, wholesale costs wholesale price they are paying for these huge times the quantity of goods that they are supplying so we're abstracting uh, abstracting away here from any other marginal costs uh, uh, that they uh, that they will incur in selling this so that's uh, just assumed to be zero so the only cost that this, that, this down, that this downstream firm is incurring is this, this wholesale cost of buying the input good. So this is a one-to-one -one technology, so for each unit of, uh, of sales that they make to end users, they buy one unit essentially of upstream input quantities from the upstream supplier. So indeed, so there's, there, the, the profit is P minus W times quantity that will be sold to consumers. So what does this firm do? It's going to set its price, and that will depend obviously on what this observed W this input is. So then we step back. So we uh, go to the problem for the uh, for the first stage player, uh, the player which is moving in the, in the first stage, which is the upstream guy. So this upstream firm is going to choose you know, what's the W that the wholesale price that we are going to set. Taking into account what the response will be of this downstream firm in stage two, so that's why 
in this uh, over here we see well the q the quantity that this upstream firm is going to sell to the downstream firm will depend on the price that will result in the uh, final demand in in the market which is going to be a function of w and this function of w was computed essentially already in stage two multiplied by the margin that this upstream firm is making well what is their margin it's the whole surprise that they get per, per unit of product minus the cost of producing that unit of product so it will be instructive for you to actually do this extra computation uh, in the case of a linear demand form so this is you know, your, your typical linear demand will look like the quantity is some constant let's call it a minus price and once you've done that why don't you check in uh, the book uh, by motta in uh, section 6.2 Point one, point one, where he does actually that computation for you. So do this first, and then check whether, to what extent, you agree with with Mota's computation. So more in general, uh, we can actually uh, say some things about this. So uh, the first thing that I would like to say here um, is what we would like to know is what it would be the maximum profits that you, the upstream firm, and D, the downstream firms might hope to make together jointly from these consumers so what are what would their total profits be and how could they maximize the total amount of profits that they can extract essentially from consumers so what are their joint total profits well they're the sum of course of the profits that the downstream firm is making by d which is p minus w times the quantity plus by u, which is w minus the modern cost of using them times q. And if you add those up, you see that, uh, of, of course, this w, this wholesale price, is actually dropping out from this expression because it's just going to be the transfer redistribution of money among the downstream and the upstream guy, but it won't affect, in a direct sense, uh, the total joint profits that these two firms are, are making. And then you might ask, well, together, these two firms, uh, they will make profits of this size. What would they have to do in order to optimize the total profits that they make from the market, apart from how they are going to distribute those two, those profits among, uh, among themselves? So if you want to maximize these joint profits, it means you have to maximize P minus C times Q of P. Well, that should be a simple enough question because you know, what is maximizing this expression? We're just finding what's the monopoly price and what's the monopoly quantity. This is just a monopoly problem, problem right? So it's, if they act together, they will just monopolize this market and maximize their profit, find the optimal P and, optim and the optimal Q. So what we then boil down to, well, I would to compute the, 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 the the profit maximum, the joint profit maximized price, well, by finding the price which maximizes this joint profits. So it's nothing different from just taking the derivative of pi d plus pi u, or taking the sum of the two derivatives and setting those to, to zero. So that's what monopoly price uh, will satisfy, right? So that's basically the definition of the monopoly price. So what is the actual outcome from this game? Well, that's going to be slightly different. It's not going to be the monopoly price. So the monopoly price, again, that's the price which satisfies the first order con con condition that it maximizes the sum of pi d plus pi u, so the joint profits. So what happens in reality in this, uh, in this game? Well, again, this uh, started at the second stage of the game where the downstream firm is going to choose its P observing wholesale price W and what's going to, to do is going to say well I want to choose the price the retail price in such a way that I'm going to uh, the first order condition will be the first derivative of my own profits by D with respect to price I'm going to set that equal to zero so let's compare these two expressions here so here is the uh, Joint profit maximize, maximization. Here is actually the decision, the private profit maximization decision 
that uh, the downstream firm is going to to take into account when setting the price p because it's a downstream from d which is going to set the price p now obviously these two conditions are slightly different right so we for in, in a way if, if we are thinking about you, know, you ought to be able to monopolize all these consumers so we ought to be able to get these total joint profits uh, maximized well, if you if you compare those two, well, the difference here is this term here. So this downstream firm is not taking into account the effect on joint profits, which is basically the second term over here. So the second term is the derivative of the upstream profits with respect to price p. So why do the upstream profits depend on price p? Well, of course, because the quantities that are going to be sold into the market depend on the price p. So W minus C themselves. They are not depending on, pre, on P, but the quantity, yeah, that's the, that depends on, on P. So there is a term here which is not taken into account by this downstream um, firm D. And as long as this uh, wholesale profit margin is positive, W minus C is positive, positive, well then this term is going to be negative, right? Because Q prime is, of course, a negative term, so demand is downward sloping. So we're ignoring here uh, a term which is a negative term. And if you think a bit about this, that's going to mean if we sort of ignore, by just focusing on this part, by ignoring that second term, that's going to mean that P is going to be set slightly too high. So this downstream firm is going to charge prices which are larger than the prices which are going to maximize joint profits of both the downstream and the upstream firm, as long as, again, W minus C is bigger than zero. So that's sort of awkward, strange. So if these two firms would get together, they would see, oh, of course, we can maximize total profits, and then the only problem that remains is we just have to distribute those profits among ourselves in such a way as to uh, as to maximize our joint uh, as uh, uh, and in such a way to so that both of us are happy. Now, apparently, something is happening which is not causing us not to maximize those profits. So our aggregate profits are too low. We could have had something more. You know, more is always better than less, obviously, in business. Uh, so whatever way we uh, divide this, we can both actually get better off by lowering price a bit towards the monopoly level rather than setting price at this price which is which exceeds the monopoly level so this is a problem of double marginalization so and the reason for this name of course is there is a margin on the upstream side w minus c that's a profit margin that the upstream firm is making and then on top of that the downstream firm is adding its own margin for getting the profit effect, or not taking into account uh, in the first place, the profit effects of that decision on the upstream firm's profits. So pro prices are too high from a joint profit maximization point of view. So note this is actually bad for the firms, it's also bad for consumers. So monopoly price is bad, but anything excessive exceeding the monopoly price now. Uh, level that's worse for consumers, right? So it's, this is destroying welfare all over the place. So we're not maximizing joint surplus, these two firms. Uh, again, because of this failure to internalize the other guy's profits when you're choosing your profit margin. And these two firms might recognize this and they might want to improve their situation. And one way, one, one way out of this, of this conundrum, if you wish, one way out of this problem would be for these two firms to merge. And so this is often, this is often quoted as one of the reasons why firms might actually want to merge. It's going to be good for welfare because this is going to eliminate these, uh, these double marginalization problems. Why? Well, if these two firms are merged, then it's just one, essentially one player who's going to make all the decisions and they can actually coordinate pricing decisions and make sure that the 
end user price is actually set equal to this monopoly price rather than to this even higher double marginalization price. So that would improve um, welfare all over. So it improves total profits and it improves consumer welfare. Is this the only solution? Is vertical integration the only solution? Well, not, of course, not necessarily. So as long as both of these firms are recognizing this problem of double marginalization, they might actually just get together. They might get together and say, listen, if we don't do anything, I'm just going to charge you a blunt wholesale price. And then you, a downstream firm, you're going to just add your own margins. Well, then surely we can do better than that. Let's just figure out a better way to contract. Why don't we have a more efficient way of setting prices? And one of these more efficient con types of contracts that we might have instead of this very simple wholesale pricing contract, this linear wholesale pricing cont contract with just one wholesale price W, let's agree to write a nonlinear contract. What might such a nonlinear contract look like? What might, it, for instance, be of the form of this two-part tariff that we discussed before. So why not have a contract which does not say, well, if you take three times this, the quantity, you pay three times as much, but rather say, no, we're going to set some variable price, we call this a transfer price, the variable fee, W. And in addition to that, we also have a fixed fee. So just an amount of money that's going to be independent of the amount of quantity that you are going to buy. Will this allow us to circumvent this problem? Yeah, sure, it will, because you know, it will, it's not so hard for you to, to verify that if we now set this variable part of the price equal to marginal cost, well, let's actually have a look. If we set the variable cost, which actually does appear in this, so the, actually the, the fixed part does not appear, because uh, we take the derivative of a fixed part at zero. So this is just going to be now the variable part of the profits. As long as we are able to set W equal to C, well then this additional term is going to be zero. So there is actually no distortion in the pricing decision of the downstream firm. So the problem of double marginalization is vanishing. So let's do that. Let's just set this whole set price, the variable part of this fee equal to C. Well then surely the uh, the end user price is going to be the monopoly price, price, just what we wanted. Why well, is that all? No, of course not, because you know if we set W equal to C, then all else equal the upstream guy would get nothing, which would just get profits equal to zero, and that's not necessarily what what's going to be uh, in their uh, interest. So let's add to this a fixed fee. Let's call it F, which is going to make sure that we distribute these additional gains among. The, uh, the upstream and the downstream firm. So this nonlinear two-part tariff with variable fee W equal to C to the marginal cost incurred by the, by the upstream company, that's going to solve this problem. That's just one solution, basically. There's lots of other solutions. So another one would be quantity forcing. So remember, quantity forcing means a contract which just says, well, this is the amount of quantity that we are going to trade. And there is no choice here. You don't have to optimize. You know, we have already agreed this. You, you get one ton of goods, and that's what you're going to sell. And this is the amount of money that you're going to pay me. And if you want more, we have to write a new contract to do that action. So what, how would a quantity forcing contract, how would that help? Well, just agree on the total monopoly quantity. Well, that's what you're going to sell into the market, uh, retail guy. So the total monopoly quantity is sold. So we make the total monopoly profits. And then we'll set the price, the fee here, the fixed fee, again in such a way as to distribute those monopoly profits and the maximum profits that together we can get in any way that we see fit. So part of it presumably going to the upstream guys and part of it going to the downstream firms. So uh, vertical integration is not the only solution to solving a uh, double marginalization problem. It's actually not probably not the most common solution. Most contracts that you would see in, act in actuality will have some non-linearities uh, in there among firms and in, in, in prices among firms because these firms are not silly. They actually see these problems as well. 
So this is basically an important principle here. So here we looked at a, a monopoly situation, a double monopoly situation, uh, but it's, uh, this is a bit more general. So here we have two parties, the upstream and the downstream firm. And if we assume, well, that's an assumption, it's typically not completely true, there will be some, uh, some, uh, um, so, some, some uh, cases here that, we, that one might have to go into. Uh, but if we assume that these two parties can bargain in an efficient way, so they can reach effic efficient solutions, then for sure they will agree on a, any contract which is going to maximize their joint surplus. Well, why is that? If they somehow end up at some contract after the negotiations where they see, oh, this is not maximizing what we get together, they can always do better. Because they can always say, oh, let's take the contract that we had, and now take away this slight distortion away from optimality, make sure that we get even more, and then we can always distribute that an extra bit in such a way that both of us are better off, that both of us will be happy. So they will always have an incentive to keep on negotiating until joint surplus is maximized, and then they can sort of decide on how they will distribute this and this surplus. So this uh, idea is also at work in uh, when more downstream players uh, will be uh, will be present. So uh, suppose we have uh, two downstream players, two retailers, and suppose these uh, two ret retail players. Uh, are engaging in bird hunt competition. So let me actually do that uh, on paper. So let me uh, switch to the uh, paper here. So we have uh, this manufacturer, this upstream supplier, which is actually supplying both a downstream player one and a downstream player two. And now the question is, you know, what would be the contract here that um, this upstream guy might be offering to these two downstream guys who are actually competing a la Bertrand. So these two symmetric firms, homogeneous good market, they're setting prices. And this upstream firm is offering a variable fee and a fixed fee to firm number one and a variable fee and a fixed fee or variable fee and a fixed fee uh, two, uh, to uh, company two. Bertrand competition. Well, what do these companies do if they are faced with the variable fee W? Uh, so Bertrand competition with uh, their costs will be W1 and W2, the cost for the, down, the downstream cost, because that will be their input prices. If you are engaging in Bertrand competition and you are facing marginal cost W1 and W2, who is going to produce? Well, the guy with the lowest cost, right? He's going to make all the sales. And particularly if these two costs are the, are the same, so W1 equals W2, What's the price is going to be under Bertrand competition? Price is going to be equal to W1 equals W2. That's what Bertrand competition does for you. It takes away basically all the margins uh, that these uh, two downstream firms are going to set. So the profits of the one and uh, the profit of the two are going to equal zero under Bertrand competition. This homogeneous good market market. So what is going to solve the problem? Well, this upstream guy will set W equals Pn. So why is that? As long as this variable cost here is uh, exactly equal to the monopoly price, well, what are the prices that these downstream firms are going to set? Well, they will be equal to the marginal cost that they face. Well, what are those marginal costs? It will be their wholesale prices equal to the monopoly price. So the market price P equals PM. And that's exactly what this joint collection of firms, particularly this upstream firm, 
would like to have. It would like to set the monopoly price to the entire market. So is that all? Yeah, well, that can actually be all. So the upstream firm will set wholesale prices equal to monopoly price, thereby ensuring that the price that's going to be charged to the consumers who sit here or buying from these two firms, that the price that these consumers are facing is exactly the monopoly price. So these consumers pay the monopoly price. These two firms make nothing because they pay exactly, you know, the profits are zero essentially. That's what Bertrand Competition is doing. So it's precisely the upstream firm here which is capturing all the monopoly rents, just what it wanted because it's a monopolist. So in the Bertrand competition market, there is actually no such thing as uh, double marginalization if, if, this, if these firms are completely uh, homogeneous. Uh, and the, uh, the upstream firm can actually easily, even without two partners, because these Fs can be zero because these firms are not making any profit. These downstream firms are not making any profits to begin with. So just by setting the uh, wholesale price equal to the monopoly price, uh, the option firm makes sure that uh, total monopoly profits are reaped from consumers and flow into its own pockets. So no distortions away from monopoly, even worse than monopoly in this case. How is this with Kuno competition? Well, that's slightly different. So uh, you remember, of course, Kuno competition in the homogeneous market, that's competition in, uh, in, uh, in quantities. So what happens with uh, with Kuno competition? So again, this uh, this upstream firm is going to supply um, these downstream firms with a, a con uh, through a contract, which again uh, consists of some fixed fixed part F and some variable part W. So what's the uh, profits for the downstream firms? So by the one essentially is going to be. Uh, um, B minus, but no, let's just take a symmetric situation in which both firms get a W and, uh, and an F, which are the same actually, so let's just call that W. So P minus W times the Q of P, that's again the uh, downstream firm wants um, profits and similar for, similar for downstream uh, firm two. And they are deciding on their on their quantities. Um, so the um, um, total. Uh, so this is a Cornell market. Well, let's let's make an assumption. Actually, make this a bit easier by uh, assuming linear demand here. So let's just say that the price is going to be equal. Just to make to choose equal to choose a simple um, parameters here, and 1 minus Q1 minus Q2, so 1 minus total quantity equals price, that's the demand equation here, the inverse demand equation, if you wish. So let's plug that in, so this, this assumption of linear demand, and we would have pi for D1 is then 1 minus Q1 minus Q2 minus W times Q1, and pi of d2, same thing, 1 minus price minus cost times the quantity supplied by q2. So let's do actually the, uh, the second stage again. So in the second stage, we have this corner competition among these two firms. Uh, so let's work out what is the, actually the, uh, the quantities and the prices that will emerge in equilibrium as a function of this wholesale price w over here. So how do we do that? We have just set the pi the q equal to zero. So choose the optimal quantity, taking as given the quantity that the uh, the other firm is providing. So that will mean that one minus two q one minus q two minus w equals zero. So it's a first order condition for firm. 1, and similarly we have a first order condition for firm 2, and that will of course look like 
And same thing but with one and two interchange so these are the first order conditions for these uh, for this corner equilibrium and of course now we can easily solve this in particular we have a symmetric situation here so this symmetric solution here where q1 equals q2 is going to be 1 minus w divided by 3. So this is the corner equilibrium and you might recognize this uh, actually from uh, previous uh, encounters with the uh, Kuno uh, duopoly. So this is the duopoly quality. So is this a nice quality from the point of view from the upstream guy or from the point of view of the industry who actually doesn't want Kuno but wants monopoly quantities? Well, it depends on what W is, right? So you have to now ask the question, can we somehow, if we are the firms, if I'm from you, if I'm this upstream monopolist, can I somehow choose this W in such a way that what was realized for consumers is exactly the monopoly quantity? So what's the monopoly quantity? What would that be? It would be the quantity which is going to maximize the rents which are extracted from uh, consumers. Well, I'm sure you know it in this linear example, the monopoly quantity is going to be 1 minus C over 2. So the question is, can we make sure that the total quantity that's sold in this Kuno downstream market is going to be equal to the aggregate monopoly quantity? Well, total quantity is twice this, right? So it's one firm is selling half of it, the other firm is selling half of it. So what W, in other words, would we have to set to make sure that together these two Kuno companies are going to sell the total industry monopoly quantity? So in other words, we want to make sure that, how can we make sure that 1 minus W divided by 3 is equal to the monopoly quantity divided by 2? Because we have twice this quantity sold in this market. Well, if you do the math, it's not too hard. Uh, so I'll leave this for you to do at home. Um, but what it means is that this w, sorry, w should be equal to a quarter plus three quarters C. So as long as we make sure, as, mon as upstream monopolist, that the variable fee of my contract, the contract that I'm offering to these two downstream firms, that this variable fee is a quarter plus three quarters C, well then the Kuno firms are going to take this variable fee as their input cost, they're going to compete a la Kuno, they reach quantities given by this expression over here, if we plug in the W here, that expression will be for each firm exactly half the monopoly quantity. So in aggregate, the result of all this is that together these Kuno firms will be actually selling uh, the monopoly quantity into the market. So indeed here again, we have a way of using two part tariffs um, to enforce, if you wish, monopoly prices and monopoly quantities in the end user market now taking into account that these two firms, D1 and D2, are competing a la Kuno, so competing in quantities, by making sure that, you know, the, exactly this, this wholesale price that we are charging, so the variable part of this, of this fee, is related to my cost in this particular way. So then competition in the second stage will ensure we are making monopoly profits on aggregate. Is the distribution of profits going to be okay? Well, not necessarily. Well, if I have all the market power as the upstream firm, I might want to add to this variable fee, a fixed fee, which is extracting all the excess profits that, that these downstream firms are making and make sure that they get in my own pocket. Or otherwise, you know, if these uh, downstream firms also have some market power of the they will bargain for a better deal and perhaps they might be able to sort of keep some of the rents here. So that depends on the distribution of bargaining power among these two firms. So let me then get that back to the uh, slide. So that's basically what, uh, what we did here is on this slide. So if you have Bertrand competition, 
And it's easy to make sure that uh, monopoly profits are realized just by setting wholesale price equal to uh, monopoly price. If uh, we have Kuno competition, we can again choose W in a slightly more uh, complicated way, but you know, it's uh, not, not that complicated. Just by taking into account the markups that will result as a result of uh, Kuno competition, making sure that end user prices will again remain at monopoly levels and then only using the fixed fees after that to make sure that we distribute those rents in such a way as we like. So there's one uh, pro-competitive motivation for these uh, uh, kinds of, uh, uh, of contracts. So they're uh, pro-competitive because well, it's, it sounds perhaps a bit uh, counterintuitive we are sort of reaching monopoly outcomes. But remember, if we don't do this, if we have double marginalization, then we get price levels which are even above monopoly. So in that sense, it's better to have actually this coordination among these firms rather than have all these, these price externalities. So some other externalities are, uh, for instance, quality. So uh, if a retailer can provide service qualities to, uh, to boost its sales, well, that's also benefit, will also benefits, benefit the, the manufacturer, the upstream uh, supplier. So indeed, if I'm a manufacturer, I would like to have retailers provide a lot of service quality but this retailer might actually think, well, if I'm providing a lot of sales, uh, sales services and sales information, it's not just me that's going to uh, to uh, be be uh, as to be going to be benefit of this uh, of these services, but it might also be my competitors down the street who sell the same goods, uh, and the consumers might come to me to get the information, and then go to my to the neighboring firm basically to buy the goods. So I'm going to tone down on my on my uh, my service my sales efforts well the manufacturer would not like that so they would like to add something in the contract to make sure that indeed retailers have all the incentives to provide service uh, quality well sometimes actually that can be contracted you can just if you can just write down you know, we ask you to provide this information we can contract we can define exactly the kind of quality of service quality that you we would like you to provide then you just write it in the contract you pay for it sometimes it might be hard to actually contract on quality it's just not that well verifiable um, uh, as, as necessary in a contract and then indeed vertical integration might be a solution here where indeed uh, the downstream firm will internalize the fact that it's service quality will actually benefit also its upstream parents still so it will have a sort of an increased incentive to supply such uh, such um, such quality dimensions exclusive contracts again might be uh, another a way of, of uh, enforcing such uh, such quality uh, efforts because in this case there will not be there might not be any retailer down the street that will also benefit from your service efforts is just going to be you because by exclusivity you're the only supplier the only retailer supplying you selling these goods to end users so in order to uh, get a little, little more about this uh, this part just read the mod section please uh, section 6.2 um, and with that i would like to uh, basically end uh, this discussion of some pro-competitive motivation so the next part will be anti-competitive concerns and particularly here we will be uh, worried about potential foreclosure. <laughs>